Alrighty, folks. Uh, changing gears yet again. Um, last time we spoke of the uh, internal workings of the Earth. Now we're going to really back up, uh, leave the atmosphere, go out into space, and uh, if I could get Corny back in time even and talk about, um, at some point very soon, how the Earth even came to be. Um, we're going to focus a little bit right now on... Um, how old the Earth is, how we know how old it Earth it is, and um, like I said, then we'll go back even a little further. So you'll hear me say, uh, off the cuff, all the time, four and a half billion years old. All right. It, the correct answer is four point six, and there's some numbers that come after that six that they are eternally quibbling over, all right? Um, again, I, I'm i a geologist. I'm a historical geologist, if, if anything. Um, and as such, I, I realize what huge amounts of time we're, we're working with. And I also recognize um, all of the, I don't want to say the potentials, for, for error, but I'm not trying to undermine the situation, but I realize that it is not a pinpoint of a, when, when we're talking about anything this long ago, okay? It, it's, there's not a finite pinpoint spot to say it is this number out to three decimals and so on, Meh. okay? We're doing the best we can with the, with the tools that we have and, and we've got magnitudes and we could break those magnitudes down. We've got comparative methods. Uh, we're not going to get into geologic time in here, but you, you're probably familiar with uh, um, radioactive decay, chrono dating, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we've got that. And that's amazing, and that's a great tool. But that gives you, again, margins of error. And the farther back you go, the, the, the bigger those margins are. So I, I'm not going to quibble, um, even if that point... One, when I say four and a half billion years, uh, that point one billion there is is a big chunk of time. I do understand that, and I hope you guys do as well. It's a big chunk of time. But for all intents and purposes, for all you guys ever care uh, or need to know, you say four and a half billion years old, no, nobody's going to argue with you, okay? Unless you come up with some real tool who's going to say, it is 4.64325. You know, one of those people that knows pi out six digits kind of thing. All right. And uh, bless their hearts. Got, you know, that's great. But you're good. Now, how do we know that? Well, you've heard a needle in the haystack, right? And is that an easy thing or a hard thing? Finding a needle in a haystack. That's hard, right? And, and potentially painful. Um, so we've got the same idea going on on the Earth. I remember the other day we talked about two kinds of crust, right? We talked about the continental crust, which is granite. We talked about the oceanic crust, which is basaltic, both igneous rocks that you'll learn soon. Uh, but we said on top of all that, you, you hardly ever see it, because on top of all that is tons and tons of what? What other kind of rock? What other kind of stuff? Sediment, right? And sedimentary rock. And sedimentary rock, as you'll learn very soon, is made up of bits and pieces of all kinds of other rocks. It's, it's like a handful of sand glued together, literally, in some cases. Do you think all that sand in your sandbox came from the same rock? All the sand on a beach come from the same rock? Same seashells? Oh, of course not. All right. And we have just as big a problem, or that is, that is super important, when we go to date sedimentary rocks. You, you don't date sedimentary rocks, and there's a lot of really bad jokes about dating sedimentary rocks. But um, you, you don't date them because you're going to get all these. You go one here, and you get one age. You go to the other side of the rock, you get another age, you get another age. Because it's made up of pieces parts. Okay? So the rock at the surface of the earth is made up of fragments of, of all the rocks that have ever been really hard to use that to get an exact date. So far, 
they've done pretty dang close. They've come up with 4.54. All right. So far, finding a hunk of rock on Earth to date, excuse me, we've come up with 4.54 billion years. A bit about abbreviations. BY is billion years, MY million years. You'll see uh, BYA, MYA, that's a go. Uh, BYO is not bring your own. It's billion years old. It just gets tired writing all that stuff over and over again. So, how do we know how old the Earth is? We know how old the Earth is uh, because of a couple things. Uh, one, we believe in something called the Solar Nebula Theory, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment. All right. Um, two, because we believe in the Solar Nebula Theory, when we are lucky enough to grab a hunk of an asteroid or a meteorite or whatever you want to call it, those big rocky or iron chunks that occasionally smash into the Earth. Um, we could date those and come up with a really good idea of the age of the Earth. All right. Now, again, the reason we need to use stuff like that is because it's really, really hard to find original intact materials at the surface. Okay. Um, or even in a, a huge cut like the Grand Canyon. All right. uh, we've got a nice slice right into the earth and, and in any other number of huge crevices like that. So the idea is that the meteorite or an asteroid has been flying around in space more or less untouched since the beginning of the solar system. Okay. And I don't want to get ahead of my slides here. But I do have to do a little precursor, I guess. Uh, solar nebula theory, in, a, in a just a 30-second nutshell here, possibly even less, tells us that everything in the solar system is approximately the same age. Okay, We'll explain the how and why in, in a little bit. But solar nebula theory tells us that everything in the solar system is more or less the same age. So when we find a hunk of pure, untouched stuff, we can age date that, and it applies to pretty much the birthday of, of everything in the solar system. We'll have an asterisk on that in a couple minutes, though. So the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Again, you see why I'm comfortable cutting it down to 4.5, because... The oldest known thing we've dated is 4.54, even though we have a meteorite coming in at a little higher. Right there is the original hunk that we used to date. Um, it happened in um, Arizona. It's a big crater in Arizona. And um, that fragment uh, is the one that we originally age dated with. The neat thing about craters, you look up at the moon, um, and is it is it pretty pockmarked, or is it a nice smooth place up there? Yeah, it's, it's pretty beat up, isn't it? Uh, they don't have weathering and erosion up there, okay? We do. Yeah, the moon potentially took some blows for us, but we have to assume that we got hit just as frequently, if not more so, we're bigger, right, uh, than the moon did. Um, yet, we don't see that many craters uh, on the surface of the Earth. They're covered over and or erased by weathering and erosion. There was a guy just getting started in his research um, back in Ohio when I was unfortunately just finishing mine. If I had the gumption to go on for a doctorate back then, I, I, it, that would have been so awesome. He was using new technology at the time, this ground-penetrating radar, to uh, image for buried um, craters under the same idea of 
you know, there's got to be a whole bunch more here. We just can't see them because they're, they're buried under all this sediment. And I never, you know, touched back to see how he'd done with that. One of these days, I should Google him, see how many papers he, he wins, if he's still out there doing work and so on and so forth. I don't know if it was an old guy or a young guy. I just remember hearing about it at the time. And it was some pretty neat stuff. I would have enjoyed that personally. So we've got these hunks. They've got to be all over the place. But again, finding them is tough. Now, it just so happened that the um, Native Americans in, in this locale had a big hunk of this meteorite, as is, is, is often happens in any country. Uh, folks that have been there an incredibly long time tend to hold on to these odd things that get passed down from generation to generation. So we were able to get a small sample of it. For scale, that's the visitor center, and that's the road. Not the biggest impact crater we've, we've found, but it's pretty damn big. Um, so this is just obviously a fragment of, uh, of what it was. All right, so we can use things such as this meteorites um, because we believe in the Solar Navy Theory. And again, you're not supposed to use the word believe in science. We accept the Solar Nebula Theory. And what it tells us is that the sun and everything around it, solar system, okay, formed out of a nebula. And for those of you that won't know, you'll hear a lot more about nebulas uh, soon. A uh, nebula is a cloud of gus and, gus, gas and dust um, that is both the beginning and the end of a star. What do they call it when a star explodes? Anyone remember? Supernova. Supernova. Wow. Good. You guys are awesome. All right. Well, what do you think a supernova leaves behind? It leaves a, a big mess, right? It's a cloud of gas and dust. Okay. Um, so a supernova leaves behind a nebula. Over time, that nebula will condense, come back together, and form another star and if the right elements are present, planets as well. It's recycling. It's how we got our elements through fusion in supernovas. Again, I'm jumping the gun, but it, it's really important stuff. But more importantly, yeah, I do have it. Okay. So, uh, a nebula. If you ever want to, uh, you're bored and you, and you want to look at some cool pictures on the internet that um, you haven't ever seen before, uh, Google nebula and even put in the word Hubble for the Hubble telescope and nebula. Um, and then click on the images tab for Google. There's some beautiful stuff out there. Um, this is the Crab Nebula. And they don't look. It's like constellations. Half the time, they don't look anything like what we named them. There's the Eagle Nebula, the Crab Nebula. Cat's Eye Nebula kind of looks like a cat's eye. Um, but there's some amazing, amazing stuff out there. This is in the constellation Taurus. And it's uh, 6,500 light years away. All right. I know it's been a long time since we talked about uh, light years. OK. Um, but you do remember, I hope, that light years are really big distances. And uh, along the lines of 6 trillion miles, if my memory serves me correctly, 5.9, something like that. So we'll go again for math's sake. 6 trillion miles. So 6 times 6,500 is how many trillion miles this is away from us. A long, long, long way away. And it starts to make distances like how far the sun is, which you will learn for this test, seem almost insignificant. It's, it's really crazy how big things can get. So this is a nebula. And what we're saying is that things like this, 
will condense down into a star. And then whatever riffraff is left over that doesn't go into the star will eventually come together and form planets. We'll walk you through it, don't worry. So we already talked about supernova. All right, you guys knew that one, or maybe you saw the slide on there. I don't know. Either way, I'm good. I told you that this um, recycling of, of solar systems is what gives us our, um, our periodic table, what gives us our elements. As far as we can tell, a star is only capable of fusing, uh, gluing together, uh, making elements up as high as iron which isn't very high in the periodic table. I don't remember what number it is, but it's not very high. We've got all kinds, 7,500 elements come after it. Not 100, but at least a good 60 to 70 elements that come after it. So if, if those elements, uh, if, if, if stars can make elements, fuse them together, hydrogen, helium, and, and so on and so forth, it only goes up to iron. They were really stumped as to how we got all this other stuff. And somebody realized that the, uh, the heat that these things create, um, and then they did their spectral analyses and all that stuff after somebody had the, the idea. The heat from a supernova is capable of fusing, well, everything else, way beyond iron. Um, so over the years, this is how we've built up our collection of, of, of elements, the, the big term is, is stellar synthesis, and um, it's how we got what we got today, time after time after time again. So I've got some nice little pictures here in the background, and we're actually starting at the uh, top right here. All right, and we got that nebulous looking thing. And then we come down to a, a, a really a fairly organized swirly cloud thing, maybe like one of our hurricane pictures that we saw before. The lightest elements, um, hydrogen and helium, hydrogen predominantly, uh, go together in the center and um, clump together. Why do they clump together? Gravity, okay? It's just they bump into one another, they fuse and gravity tells us that um, the more mass you have, in other words, the more clumps that are fused together, the more likely you are to fuse, to, to, to bump into more. And that kind of increases logarithmically, right? And if there's some other clumps that are already stuck together somewhere else in there, they're going to have a gravitational pull, and those two gravities are going to suck together that much more likely, and, and so on and so forth. And what happens is, is that, that really just that sparks up super, super quick. As you can imagine all those those molecules um, uh, banging around in there. There's a lot of friction, okay, and that frictional heat just, and at that point everything just just falls right in there, and you've you've sparked up your star. All right, the heavier stuff, because this is spinning, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, the heavier stuff actually is able to sort of fling out. Do you remember, I haven't seen it in a while, but I think it's still around. They still do spin art, like at fairs and festivals and whatnot. You put some paint uh, on, a, on a flat piece of uh, cardboard or whatever, and they spin it around some sort of centrifuge underneath, and well, the paint goes off in a variety, whoops, variety of, of directions, um, and you get this, this funky spin art thing. Um, if you don't know what that is, uh, you've probably had the unfortunate luck to be in uh, a ride called, what is it, the Gravitron or something like that. A horrible, horrible ride uh, where they spin you around in a circle really, really quickly. They drop out the floor and you're stuck to the wall like a, a paper doll. Okay. Um, it's the same force that holds you to the wall. Okay. Um, that allows these materials to, to, to fling outwards as this thing is spinning. Horrible ride, by the way, if I hadn't mentioned that. Uh, it is solely dependent, your safety, uh, you sticking to the wall is, is, is only dependent on how fast that sucker's revolving. If it should slow down, God forbid they have some sort of, you know, malfunction, 
you guys are going to slide right down off the wall and get all mangled. Don't ride that ride. Bad ride. Um, anywho. So, flinging out. Now, you may wonder, well, why is this damn thing spinning in the first place? All right. We have to hearken back to another almost extinct critter uh, called the merry-go-round. But hopefully you've seen one on TV. Maybe you've had the opportunity to play on one. But I know there's not a whole heck of a lot of Manutica. So, um, with a merry-go-round, you are supposed to sit nicely while your teacher pushes you around in a circle. That's what you're supposed to do. This is why they all disappeared, by the way, because nobody did that. Uh, instead, you would stand on it, and your friends would fling, 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 fling it around in circles as fast as you can. And uh, what happens if you let go? Woo, you go flying, right? All right. Well, that's that force we just that we just talked about. But but here's the other thing. What happens? You say, "Hey, come on, join us, join us, join us!" And your friend manages to jump onto it and land and grab one of those bars. For that brief moment that they land and, and catch the bars, it speeds up. It continues that momentum. It increases that momentum. All right. And there's some physics going on there that we won't talk about. But their momentum, their added mass spins that a little bit. That's what gets this rotating. All these particles that we were talking about coming together, it, it's a natural tendency for it to start rotating. And the more stuff comes in, it, it bumps it just a little more, and it spins just a little faster. And what that also does is flatten it out. It pulls it out. The same force again that when you let go, you go flinging off to the side that stretches this disc out from a ball in, into a disc. All right. So uh, over time, whatever what, it, it flattening, rotating, it starts to layer out, as you can see. All right. And there's some weird things with gravity. Um, you know, we told you the heavier stuff was able to escape, but only so far. And the lighter stuff that wasn't hydrogen and helium is actually able to go out even farther because while the more mass you have, the more you're affected by gravity, the, the less mass you have, well, the less you're affected by gravity. So the lighter elements were able to go out even a, a little further. And I'm telling you all this stuff you, you probably didn't want to hear because it actually explains the placement of our, our planets. All right, what is closest to the sun? There, there's like two types of planets, right? You got the these planets and the those planets. Which ones are closest to the sun? You guys remember from Earth Science? Well, no, the names, yeah, that's awesome. But no, I'm not looking for names. They're, they're a type. Terrestrial, the rocky planets, all right? Made out of that big heavy stuff we're talking about. And what comes further out past the terrestrials? We got the, we got the gassy ones, okay, the gas giants. And now they're even using the word ice giants which may cause us to um, relook at solar nebula theory because something I was reading, and, and again, I'm, I'm just a minor, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm low in this game, um, but something I was reading gave me cause to think that uh, Neptune, which is way the hell out there, is uh, actually made of denser stuff than, than Saturn and Jupiter, um, if I read their article correctly. Um, they may be revisiting this at some point. But as it stands, all right, it's, it's, it's density separation. You're going to hear density separation. Uh, well, you heard it, uh, I think, with the layering of the Earth, we use the word as well. So centrifugal force, conservation of angular momentum, those are some of the words that I was alluding to. You will not see those on the test. All right, just think of them as the merry-go-round physics. So we got it. We go from a ball of gas and dust that kind of collapses in on itself due to gravity, basically. All right. And thanks to that gravitational pull, uh, we get a star forming in the center. In this case, the star is our sun. Um, the remaining materials that did not pull into that um, swirl around in bands around this star. Eventually, they start to bang into one another and uh, 
clumped together in a term we call accretion, which I'm not sure if I gave you. Oh, let's go through here. 90% of the matter stayed in the center. Oh, I didn't tell you that number. 90%. Again, I'm sure that's an entirely made up number, but they want you to understand that it's like the, seriously the majority of it. All right, and that very word at the bottom there is the one I was just about to drop, accretion, all right? And we use the term accretion uh, primarily for the, for the rocky planets, the terrestrial planets, um, those, those pieces, parts coming together, smashing together, and, and, and eventually um, making a, 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 what we've come to know as a planet. For some reason that I'm not sure they entirely understand, except for they'll rattle off a couple of physics things. Uh, accretion doesn't always make entire planets. What do we got between the uh, inner planets and the outer planets? Between the Rockies and the gases, what do we got? Hmm? More planets? Dwarf planets. No, dwarf planets are way, way out there, as I understand it. There, there might be one or two fairly close, but... I think the dwarves are way out there. Um, no, what else? Yeah, the asteroid belt. Okay, and their idea is that the asteroid belt is 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 the leftover leftover stuff that that didn't get accreted, or and you got a variety of people writing books about this. Another planet uh, that may have once existed. Um, we actually are pretty damn sure uh, when we talk about the moon, you'll hear about a uh, a tenth planet. Well, ninth, if you don't count Pluto, but at the time, the tenth planet um, that did smash into us uh, at some point. And again, there was a fairly good chance that that happened in the early, early solar system. Um, but again, we're going back a long, long time ago, so there's no ancient alien astronauts involved in this story. OK, um, but uh, at any rate, um, the asteroid belt, they feel, is, is, is partially accreted material, if you would. Um, and that's sort of our, our, our boundary between the inner and the outer planets. Speaking of which, how many planets do we have? Actual planets at the moment. So eight, yeah, eight. Why? What are you? What are you getting rid of with seven? Okay, no, it was originally nine. And you guys might even be to the point where Pluto's never been a planet. I don't think you guys are quite that young yet, slash old, whatever. Um, it's been a while since they demoted Pluto. A good ten, fifteen years, I'd say. Um, it was uh, challenged, diametrically challenged, and, and a couple other challenges. Uh, basically, she, she mentioned the dwarf planets earlier. Um, there are some dwarf planets that are larger than Pluto, um, so that would definitely uh, cause some concern. But there's still a mighty band out there fighting for dear Pluto. Um, but the correct answer is eight planets, dwarf planets, and um, asteroids and comets. When I ask you... What is what's that list at? Planets, comma, etc. <laughs> I guess that's your list. Um, I think there is a list somewhere. So you've got your eight planets, your dwarf planets, your asteroids, your comets, um, and your your moons, your variety of satellites. I usually use the word moon. <laughs> 